Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're speaking with Tim Portlock. He comes out of a painting tradition, actually, but he now works digitally using some of the most sophisticated tools around, like 3D gaming technology and 3D animation software. What he creates are simulations of the city of Philadelphia and other cities with large portions of the real world altered significantly. Sometimes he inserts things like a pack of dogs, for example, roaming a street, but mostly he is erasing things like houses and warehouses and people. Tim has a show at Vox in September. He'll be showing new work, and it's a continuation of the themes he's been working with, but he will be using images of Las Vegas this time. Um, we want to know if you grew up playing video games, and did you hack into video games? Is that how you got some of your ideas about <laughs> using that technology? I, I, I spent or wasted many quarters and many hours playing computer games growing up. So I, that was like the era of arcades, and um, it never occurred to me that actually that was something I could do. When, when I was a child playing computer games, like art and computer games were separate. It was only when uh, the internet became popularly available that it ever occurred to me that those two things could go together. Um, so uh, I actually ended up going back to school to get another MFA uh, in a, something called electronic visualization. And that, one of the things that interested me about doing that kind of program specifically is I got to um, work on projects with computer scientists and computer engineers. For a chunk of time, I was uh, learning and working on really expensive research equipment. But once I got out of school, I no longer had access to that equipment. So I had to um, f improvise the next closest thing that was affordable to me, which was 3D first-person shooter computer games. Um, after I got out of school for that second MFA, um, I actually had a job for a couple of years working for a university using this technology to do simulations of historic neighborhoods. It was called virtual cultural heritage work. Um, so I was for a couple of years doing simulations of northern Paris. Why Paris? So one of the projects I worked on when I was in school was called Virtual uh, Harlem. And um, at some point, we made connections with the University of Paris. And we were interested in making a simulation of a part of Paris where a lot of writers and other cultural people from the Harlem Renaissance had lived, and talking about um, some of the cultural cross-pollination that had happened between the two places. Who's the we? I'm not so sure. it was people from the University of Missouri, University of Illinois, and the University of Paris for. And and what were their the, goals? I'm not understanding so the group. The, the goal, I think the, the main goal was to see how this technology could supplement um, learning uh, about English literature. Some of what I was doing were look, was looking at places that exist that were important in the past. Some of it was detective work. So some of the places that were really popular for some of the figures that I was looking at no longer exist. And there, were, there, there wasn't an address or the building was torn down. So I'd have to figure out where to go to get photographs of this building, where exactly was that building located. And then, if it, and, then, and then create what is no longer there, or create or recreate it in a way, or re-simulate it in a way that looks like it did in the 1920s. So um, let's talk about your process a little. You were, you're explaining that you're working on simulations, and many people are not going to know exactly how you would get a simulation up and running and what that means. So I actually, I have to preface this. This is like one of the hardest things to con convey to people. Like I hear how I'm ex explaining it and I think I'm being clear and then people are hearing <laughs> something different. And that's, um, I think that's kind of a testament to how uh, convoluted the process is. Um, so I uh, will ride my bike around West Philly and um, I'll identify abandoned buildings and I'll photograph them. So 
For the most part, I use those photographs as reference images. Then the next thing I do is just go through the images and, and think about which buildings just appeal to me. Uh, so once I sort of work that out, then I use uh, 3D animation software, computer game making software to make a 3D model of the buildings. Can you give the name of some of those programs? So some of the those? some of the software I'm using, the main, well, the one that a lot of people who work mostly in this field would know is Maya. I use some other kind of less known software, like there's like really small niche communities for us. I use something called Vue, which enables me to make realistic looking nature. So like there's a lot of weeds in my work. Um, it's impossible to do any of the work I do with just like one thing. So, uh, but just to describe what it does a little bit better is imagine that I'm uh, creating digital sculptures of the buildings that we see. And these digital sculptures only exist on my computer. And I'm using photographs to figure out the proportions. Sometimes what I will do is use color from those photographs, those digital photographs, to paint these 3D sculptures. Um, and then finally, I arrange these buildings and, and compositions that I think are interesting or explain something. And then I um, ultimately render these things out into 2D files. I make really large prints, so there's not, I don't, I don't have a 64 inch wide inkjet printer, so I have to work with print shops. So I've been working with um, Silicon Fine Arts in Philly the whole time I've been doing this. You mentioned to us earlier before we started talking that uh, in order to render these things so that they look realistic and the light comes from the right direction and all that, that your computer can't handle it. So how do you right. do that? So there's a lot of um, effects <clears throat> in the images that I use that uh, are really processor intensive. So let's say I have a, a puddle of water with little ripples uh, created by the wind. Um, that's something that would my computer could do, but it might take several months to process that out into a 2D image. Um, so sometimes, especially when it's getting close to exhibition time, I will send that file and any kind of uh, helper files um, to something called a render farm. Uh, which is a building that houses hundreds and hundreds of computers that are networked together. Basically, all these computers focus on processing the file that I send into one image. So uh, a month worth of processing time on my laptop could be an hour at the render farm. And what's kind of interesting about that is these render farms are located all over the world, and the render farm that I typically use is located in France. So I just electronically send the file there, and I'll sometimes get it back within the hour, like a 2D image back within the hour. So you have to know in your mind what it's going to look like, even though, but you can't see it on your computer screen when you send it to them, well, so it's an act of faith well, kind what, of thing. Well, what takes a lot of time is my Im my images are really large but if I actually rendered them out at smaller sizes like the size of a sheet of paper that can happen pretty quickly I could take like five minutes so I can look at that on my screen the only problem is is there's a lot of detail that I'm not seeing because it's small on my screen I've tried to figure this one out also so I plug in projectors and project it on the wall but I'm still seeing a degraded version of the image. So yeah, there is like a degree of a leap of faith. Like there's always like that moment. I, there's a lot of points in this process where I'm really nervous. And that's like one of the parts where I'm nervous. It's like, oh, what, is there gonna be a surprise? And you know, how long will it take me to undo that surprise <laughs> if it comes? And how much money will it take you to undo that surprise? Right, right. 
You had mentioned something about um, what you're going for in terms of content, and I'm wondering if you could talk about your content a little, where it comes from, and why you're doing that. I, w I would say the, th the thing that initiated it was my relocation to Philadelphia, and I, I, had, I had moved around a lot, uh, lived in different cities over a five-year period. I felt like every city had, like it obviously has its own thing or it's don't it's something unique about it strangely philly of all the cities i lived in philly had the strongest most unique kind of feel to it the other thing is uh i mean this is like actually pretty significant uh for me is i'm really interested in 19th century american landscape painting you have a group of artists who are um trying to construct an identity or trying to explain a national identity both to the people who are uh, citizens of this country and to people who are outside of this country. Essentially what I, what I was thinking about was the contrast between this idealism or uh, these ideas that were constructed about the United States versus kind of the reality of present day, I don't know, Philadelphia. So you were recently in a show in Dublin as a SIVA fellow? Yes. There was a photo festival in Dublin. <clears throat> and um, even though my work is created with special effects software, there's a photographic quality to the images. And so uh, I was asked to, to participate because of that. Had you been to Dublin before? I, I, I've been to Dublin 10 years ago for like five days. And I was by myself, so I didn't explore it in quite the same way as I did going in a group. I actually, I'm not like a vacation person. Like I'm not someone that just like goes somewhere to hang out. Like that's kind of unusual for me. So I actually like to get to know a place by having to go there to do something. So do you, let's back up just a second, do you not consider your work photographs? I don't. What do you um, consider? I think it has photographic qualities to it. At least in my mind, um, the work comes out of the painting tradition. So I'm st like I said, I'm still using conventions from 19th century American landscape painting. I realize that I'm not using paint, but when I think of all the references that have influenced the work, I think that's where the bulk of the references come from. But I am getting... Can you give a specific example of one of those conventions? So uh, Light is a pretty big uh, star <laughs> in a lot of my images, and... Um, uh, light was also a big feature in 19th century American landscape painting. It actually comes out of the German Romantic tradition. And it's actually a reference to God's blessing on the landscape. And so that was one of the things that uh, artists from that period were trying to communicate about um, the American landscape. It was blessed by God. And so are, you, are your paintings ironic? Yeah, there is a there is a degree of irony. About that. <laughs> yeah, they're very beautiful. We should we should describe yes. them. Can you describe? I mean, what do your skies look like? They they're kind of voluptuous and. I play around with um, clouds and the sun coming through the clouds and illuminating you know different details in the landscape. <clears throat> and then there's uh, cloudless skies that'll have. Uh, uh, a prism of color. Usually the sun is on the verge of going down or coming up, so it allows me to get like an interesting range of colors <clears throat> into the image. I was thinking on my way here about your work and how even though it sort of has this post-apocalyptic thing going mm -hmm. on, it's very different from the landscape presented in Mad Max. Right. One of the issues was this romantic light that bathes everything. Right. Right. Let's talk about the sunsets. There's okay. some where the sun is just this streak of red surrounded right. by these beautiful gray blue clouds. And, you know, what's the message there? Is it like going to be a nice day tomorrow or watch out? It's going to be terrible tomorrow. Well, I think for me, part of it is just the idea of nature. 
the difference between the way cities are imagined when they're built or they're planned versus how they're how they end up when they're not used or when they're dying and basically they're reverting back to nature nature being like the wild on the things that's not man-made or man doesn't account for part of that sunset i mean on some like i guess like semi-conscious level not only are sunsets ironic but they're also making the landscape seem more i don't know wild more natural um the one the thing that's uh, typically absent from my work is street lights or, or um, electricity. That's you, ed- you edit that all out. Well, I don't. I just don't include it because, like, I mean, I have to basically. I have to account for everything in the work. Like, if if there's no people, it's because I didn't add them. It's not because I took them out. It's like literally, I just did not add them. And I, I could see people have an argument or criticism of that, but I think it would be even more problematic if I showed people in the client. Like I, I feel like I would have to be really careful with how I do that. Um, and I, I just don't want to deal with those, those issues. Um, I feel more comfortable with dealing with talking about the same issues through architecture and you know, degradation of like infrastructure. Part of the conventions I'm working with is the difference between what things look like with your eyes versus what they look like in painting. So part of this tradition I'm dealing with is to make these ideals seem like they are part of of the natural landscape, like that something about the land just emanates, you know, freedom (laughs) and liberty and fecundity, blah, blah, blah. Um, And so there's a lot of liberties taken to manipulate these image, the, the landscape in these images to convey that. And that's something I'm definitely doing. Like I'm taking a lot of liberties in the, in the work. So we've been talking today with Tim Portlock in West Philadelphia. Thank you for talking to us. Yeah, thank you for the interview. That was great. Thank you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.